We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, welcome. My name is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host who we hold these truths. And today, we're very lucky to have with us Kamayu Marcheria, <laughs> a social justice organizer from Fairfield County, South Carolina, a former elected commissioner and county commissioner in Fairfield County. And so, Kamayu, welcome to We Hold These Truths. And I know you'd like to start by uh, reciting a poem you wrote recently in honor of Black History Month and social justice organizers. So I invite you to do that. Thank you, Kamayu. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Michael. I, I actually wrote this poem some time ago, but I want to dedicate it in Black History Month to all those who have fallen, past and present, and those who continue to struggle in the name of love and to uplift humanity. And the poem goes like this. I'm building this poem and I'm calling it a city just for you. It is built on the rock of my mind so that it will last and carry your name through time. I'm building this poem and calling it a city just for you. I'm planting flowers in the streets and I'm hanging stars on corner lampposts. I'm hanging stars on corner lampposts to light your way when you walk the streets of my memory. I'm building this poem to call it a city to, for you to show my gratitude from this moment on, you have a home. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kamayu. Uh, so uh, to introduce you to our listeners and viewers, I'd like you to say a little bit about where you grew up. Uh, I know some of that, but uh, your early life, I know you were accused of a crime you never committed or committed to 10 years in uh, an adult prison, even though you were a minor. And I wonder if you can just say something about that and that experience. Yeah, just briefly, uh, uh, Michael, at the age of, I thought I was 16, but they said I was 17. I was arrested with a group of six other people and accused of rape, kidnap, atrocious assault, and battery, county conceal, deadly weapon when I was 17. I was not present during the commission of this crime. I went to trial with an all-white jury, all-white judge, lawyers, victims, and uh, and uh, with, <clears throat> with, with this, I was convicted uh, and said, sitting to 50 to 57 years in a maximum security in Trenton State Prison. Despite the testimony of the victims and other people, I uh, told them that I was not there, that I was not part of it, and I was charged with charges of, of a gun, which I was never there. So I served 10 years, got out of, uh, uh, out of prison and tried to uplift myself and that made a commitment promise to my mother. I'll try to be a decent human being and do something she could be proud of. And of course, I lived in between uh, Philadelphia and South Carolina. I consider South Carolina home, but I was actually born in, in, uh, in Philadelphia. 
Uh, so after the conviction, I moved back home and uh, uh, started to work here in South Carolina, created a whole lot of different groups. And, and, uh, and eventually, 47 years after my conviction or relief, I was recharged uh, and placed on a sex offenders list 47 years after the crime and told that if I wanted to be offered to go back to New Jersey and, uh, and get off the list. I was never placed on a sex offender list. Uh, they never even had a sex offender list until the, the Megan Morgan, uh, Morgan, I'm trying to think, the Megan case out of New Jersey, which was uh, years after before they even created a registration. They placed me on that list and uh, I've now been on that list since uh, uh, 07 and I have to pay a $150 fine every year. And of course it has stopped me from getting jobs and, uh, and a number of other things. But despite that, the community has elected me to the office of here where I've organized for 18 years. Michael. Yeah, I wonder if you could talk something about after, a little bit about how you were able to get out of prison even though you were falsely accused. And what were some of the influences that led you uh, here you are without much of a formal education to work in social justice. Uh, what led you to do that and who influenced you to become the person you are today? Well, Michael, when I first went in, actually I couldn't read and write uh, and I was 17. I didn't learn to read and write until I was really like 21. I got my GED and I applied myself to, to some of the college programs. And, and along that way, I met a person that was in prison that uh, told me about a, uh, a, a, a student lawyer at Harvard uh, School that was by the name of Andrew Vatch, who happened to be white and Jewish, and a, and a Puerto Rican brother by the name of Ramon Jimenez, who happened to be uh, black, who was students at the Harvard Law School, heard about my case, came down and filed a number of a brief, uh, brief over the years, and uh, eventually they got me out of prison after writing a book called Parole as Post-Conviction Relief, the Robert Lewis Decision, 1973, the Harvard Review. And upon that, uh, and, and riots and other things that happened in the prison, uh, I was released in 1973, September 18, 1973, because of the investigation of Andrew Vatch and uh, Ramon Jimenez and Keith Gilliard. Right. So, and how did you uh, get into the work of organizing for justice after that? Well, Andy and Ramon were both organizers, and I never knew where the organizers were. And I and I kind of listened to the things they'd done, and I was very angry at that particular time, but particularly against white folks, because I was convinced that white folks uh, was uh, uh, was born with a serious dose of novocaine to the brain. They could see everything <laughs> that was going on, but they couldn't feel it. And I truly, you know, felt that. And and uh, but anyway, they got. I'm losing track of myself. But they kind of got me out. And after I went to college, I wanted to be a social worker. And they told me that I, I couldn't be a social worker. And I liked it when Andy and Ramon were doing as an organizer. And so I wanted to be an organizer. And so we had riots in the prison. And I was elected to the first uh, prisoner inmate committee in Trenton State Prison um, about the riots and, uh, took some prisoner, I mean, guards, prisoners and all that kind of stuff. So uh, my first election was in prison as, as an MA committee member. And when I got out, uh, uh, we started an ad hoc parole committee that was fighting for a contract parole for prisoners because you didn't know what to do to get out of prison what you did do or didn't do. It didn't seem to matter. And I wanted to be a, a social worker at, or a teacher. I really wanted to be a teacher and I didn't think I could make it because of my penal record. And so rather than being a teacher, I thought the best way to be the teacher was being an organizer. How do you go into to a community and take the steps to find out like six steps, like number one, what are people aware of in the community and, and, and pinpoint that awareness uh, and then walk them through that process of awareness and uh, what does awareness really mean of that and walk them through a process of how they adopt that awareness and how they adopt a vision and then how they adopt a strategy to deal with the things that they want within the community on a grassroots level. And uh, since I couldn't be a teacher, I said, I'll be an organizer. And years later, in 1991, the South Carolina 
uh, Social Workers Association nominated me to be a number one uh, award winner of the Social Work of South Carolina. Now, isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's amazing. And you're also a teacher, if not in a uh, formal school, but you've taught many, many people. And I wonder if you can talk about uh, how you came to South Carolina when when that was. I know your family has owned land there for many years. I know some of that land was stolen by white people and some of the campaigns you worked on there in South Carolina. Yeah, I kind of finally left uh, Philadelphia uh, in, in, uh, in 1979, 80, once I became off of parole. I was taken off of parole. I was on it for 50-something years, as it was supposed to be. And I came back, and when I came back to South Carolina, I found that there was a doctor's office, there was restaurants. I'm talking about in the 1980s that black folks weren't allowed in, and uh, that police officers would... Uh, uh, you know, stop you along the highway and give you fines and charge you things. And they stopped me one time on Highway 39, and I was the third car in line. And then when they got up to my car, they asked me, say, all right, boy, I want to see your driver license registration. Well, me with myself, I said, well, driver license registration. He said, yeah. I said, boy, yeah, yeah, boy. I said, hey, let me tell you all one damn thing. I ain't no boy. The only damn boys I know are cowboys and white boys, and I ain't neither <laughs> one of them. And let me tell you something, Michael. Before God got the news, God's supposed to know stuff before it happened. Before God got the news, they snatched me out my truck, out of the van, threw me in my car and had me in Saluda County Jail before God got the news. So that's what really got me involved with what was going on, uh, 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 what was going on there, because they told me I was in a heap of trouble, and I asked them how much was a heap. And uh, they bopped me upside the head, thought I was trying to be funny with him. I didn't know what a heap was. So uh, after that, I started an organization with young people called PALS, P-A-L-S. It stood for Praise, Assurance, Love, and Security. And that's what our kids need. And I made it kind of political, and I would organize them around political issues, at, even at the age of 11 and 12 or 13 years old. Uh, took a group of them to the ocean. They never knew the ocean was salt water, never seen it before. Things like that. And then working with the community around issues that black people, they had a, a, a group called the JCs. Black people were not allowed to swim in the, in the swimming pool that were receiving federal funds. I got together with a group of people and sued them. A uh, community-based organization receiving federal funds and had a sign out front no niggas allowed. They didn't say black people, they said no niggas allowed. And so that was the state, that was a salute where all my people were born. That was going on in the 80s. And right now, today, the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan lives in Salute. So right. stop yeah. me, Mike, because I'm just talking here. No, no, that's great. I remember when I was down there, you showed me a place where there had been a swimming pool, and rather than allowing black people to swim in the pool, they filled it in with cement. Can you uh, yeah. remind me where that was? Uh, yeah, that was in Saluda. Um, uh, and also it was another place I worked in Arkansas where that happened, where I worked with a, uh, a known organizer named Miss Brown at that particular time. Uh, some years ago, I was working with Kathy Howell and we were down there, they had covered up a swimming pool while we were working there. And this is like in the 90s. Right. So rather than even allowing the white people to swim there, they filled it in with cement. They filled it in with cement and covered it over, yes. That's really amazing. And can you tell us a little bit more about some of the things you mentioned, uh, the PALS organization with the young people? I wonder what was some of the other uh, campaigns and issues you were involved with down there in uh, South Carolina? Well, I was also involved with uh, some of the big things we were involved with, with, uh, with the petty jury system here in Fairfield County in 1983. Black people were not allowed to sit on the jury. And at that particular time, uh, when a decision was made about our land or any other thing, uh, blacks weren't allowed to sit on the jury. We filed a complaint with the federal government, the FBI, that came down here and kind of broke that up. Now, people might think that's funny. That's in 1983. Uh, we also had a nuclear power plant where most of the, the people here were 70, 80 percent black. They built a nuclear power plant, bought all the land cheaply from black people, and black folks really didn't understand what was going on. 
And we have a nuclear power plant in our black backyard where over the years it's been in an extraordinary number of people with cancer and we can't prove where it's coming from. But allegedly people think it comes from the nuclear power plant. Right. And I remember you said some of the land that your family had owned had been stolen. Can you describe how that happened and what happened there? Well, the records that I could investigate, I went through the archives and uh, looked through the records, uh, gone back, and this is in the th uh, 30s and 40s, uh, where our family owned some land in Saluda, where, uh, uh, given to my understanding, uh, white folks just took it. They took it off the land and, and uh, took it for alleged tax purposes, which wasn't tax purposes. And of course, the black folks had no resource to turn to fight them. And uh, so my family lost a, a considerable amount of land uh, uh, by that kind of thievery. Right. And you mentioned Kathy Howell. I wonder if there were other organizers that you worked with and what kind of work you, you did with Kathy. And I know you worked with others throughout the southern part of the U.S. I wonder if you can describe some of that. Uh, well, I in Fairfield County, uh, you know, working here, uh, it was 1990 when I joined the Grassroots Leadership Organization, whose uh, great leader at that time was uh, uh, Cy Khan, where everybody knows Cy Khan, an author, poet, writer, singer. Uh, uh, and that's when I first met uh, Kathy. Uh, she was working with various organizations. And as I worked with grassroots leadership, I learned a whole lot of new skills of how to organize and started to travel. Uh, Ron Charity, I don't remember, do you remember Ron Charity? Sure. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah I remember he, Ron. Yeah. Yeah, he taught Arthur Ashe how to play uh, tennis. Right. And uh, he was on the grassroots leadership staff when I first started. So I learned a lot from Ryan, Ron, rather. Uh, and then I, we started working in uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, where we had a whole lot of issues down there. We worked uh, in Mississippi. And I worked along with Kathy, who was a great organizer and an um, uh, excellent person in terms of uh, strategy and other things that she really handles good. So I, I learned a lot from her and the people that I worked with with grassroots leadership for 16 years. Right. And then sometime after that, you decided to run for office for county commissioner in Fairfield County, uh, just north of Columbia, the capital of South Carolina. Can you describe uh, how, how you made that decision and what that was like running for office? Yeah. In 1988, after we had the fight around the grand jury selection process, there were some other issues that we had. Uh, you know, the black folks lived in rural areas, didn't have access to uh, plumbing and other uh, uh, amenities. Uh, I decided to run because a seat became vacant and the community kept asking me to run. Now, one of the things I did before I even ran when I first came to this county, I'd visit every church in this county. I told them about my background before anything ever became an issue, told them about the book and they knew my history. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I decided in 1990, people asked me to run and five people ran at that particular time at that campaign. And uh, uh, blessed as it be, I won that election uh, in 1990 uh, for a two year term. And then the next year when I ran, there were four people ran against me in 1994. Uh, and I won every election all the way up to 19, uh, I mean, 20, 2016. Right. And can you describe what that was like uh, being on the county commission uh, in Fairfield County in South Carolina there? What sort of things you did and what the experience was like? Well, the experience is when you're dealing with a whole lot of people who, uh, you know, everyday people, if I go to the church and ask them to announce, uh, you know, community, uh, county council meeting, other meeting, uh, as zoning board meetings and whatnot. And a lot of times the church, they wouldn't do it, but they would stand up and announce every week, bingo, you know, and I'm like, I, I can figure it out. So people kind of fell out with me and said I was pushing uh, too hard in some instance. So the fight was really about the quality of life 
uh, in this county, majority African-American county with a substantial budget, but none of those resources were coming back to the community. So my immediate fight around the environmental stuff was the fight to get a recycling center because we throwed everything in the green container alongside the road, dead animal, dead people, and everything else. It appeared over a period of time. And then I started fighting for recreation issues and I had a recreation center built. I started fighting for fire services and I had a, a fire station uh, built. Uh, then I started fighting around the nuclear power plant that electricity went out. They didn't have a solar way of warning the people that there was, were a danger. Um, then we started fighting for things around housing. We got a $250,000 grant to rehab some of that dilapidated housing and things that were uh, in the community. Uh, another fight, uh, Michael, that I had was uh, the local bank uh, entered into an agreement with them and won $10 million uh, for the minority appendix uh, program where they were redlining the black community. And uh, we won that kind of program kind of handedly. And I'm just looking at something I don't want to just, just read from it, but it's a whole lot of different things that I, that, that I started. One of the places I had was taking some of the, the, the power groups and other proof to see the groups they see Nelson Mandela when he came to Atlanta. Right. I, I know you described redlining, although some people are likely to know what it is. I wonder if you can describe exactly what it meant in your county uh, regarding the bank and uh, housing loans. Well, we had uh, Dr. John Ruth do all the statistical data on the, on the lending and following up on those loans. And what I mean by redlining, that when it came to certain zip codes in certain areas where you were a black population, you just couldn't get a loan. If it did, it put the real strenuous um, uh, amenities to it, or what you have to pay in fines. So we kind of looked at that and tried to organize statewide with a group of uh, organizations that wasn't willing to attack, attack the banks. And uh, so we went around and looked at uh, 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 Move Your Money Day. We kind of named that total all the organization, look at the banks and all the information out. Move Your Money Day. When the banks heard that, they called us in for a negotiation. That's and, great. Uh, and that's when we uh, entered into, I asked for $20 million. We wound up with $10 million that they would give uh, to minority people, uh, you know, first time folks. But the other fight was, we needed to get folks into the banking industry that was more than just entry level clerks. We needed folks to be loan officers and bank managers and all, all that. So that was part of the fight and we did get some uh, concessions with that. Yeah, that's really good. And what are the lessons that you would, uh, looking back over your years as an organizer, as an elected official, what do you think are the most important things for younger people now uh, thinking of working for social justice, uh, what do you think are the real important lessons and things that they should think about today and in the future, Kamayu? Um, Michael, let me say this now. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of expound a little bit right now. I am okay. so perplexed, I am so perplexed and confused about having a vision for for the future because I lived through a time. In my sense, that we had boundaries. There were certain things you just didn't do. You, you know, you had respect. You, you know, and uh, you know, somewhere along the line, during my organizing and prison stuff, and where, where we're at now, those boundaries are gone. Uh, you, you know what I mean? And like, where do you go when you don't have boundaries and no respect and no civility and, and what? So. I, I, that's what's going to go on, what's trying to go on with young people. I was raised up with young people. Why is 16 you having a baby, 15, 16 years old? Because my life expectancy, if I can live to be 18, 18 years old, that would be, be great. And that was the mindset of a lot of young black people. Why do they have babies, you know what I mean? Because I'm not going to live to be 17. Uh, uh, I'm losing track of myself. Here. Well, you were saying about boundaries. You say people, uh, some young people today are lacking boundaries. Could you explain a little bit what you mean by that? Not only, not only them. Uh, uh, just we just lost respect, respect through technology or whatever it is. My brain fog, technology are taking over their minds and whatnot. I just don't see that cohesiveness. 
But on the other hand, um, uh, nothing's going to survive if the young people don't step up and, and uh, do what they need to do to, uh, to study, to, to study history, to examine the world around them, to be aware of what's going on and what is the purpose of life. And what are we really fighting about? It is there really discrimination. Because I've talked to some young people, they don't see racism like I do. You know, my family's biracial and I this and I got good friends and you talk about racism, like they don't even want to hear it because they just don't see racism that way. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you explain the institutionalized kind of racism that's going on that impacts them in a way that they can comprehend what you're talking about as it relates to racism? Yeah, how have you tried to do that when someone says they don't see the racism, even black folks? What have you tried to say about institutionalized racism? I try to point to uh, you know, examples of, of racism institutionalized, you know, in terms of pay for women, in terms of discrimination uh, with, uh, for healthcare. Like for instance, if I'm, I'm, if I'm standing in the, in, in the Senate in South Carolina and I see a black person gets up and say, uh, my good friend and colleague across the aisle there, uh, blah, blah, blah. Your friend and colleague, all his life, all his history, all his institution, and everything he tried to do in South Carolina is demise you, take away your health care, your education, your child, your protection, police lock you up, mass incarceration. How the hell is that to your good friend across the aisle? And why is the black mindset like that? This is what, what puzzles me. It's to make young people have that kind of crucial, kind of critical analysis that when something happened, happened, that analysis about what's going on. Right. And, and what have you learned? You, you are a county commissioner. And at least when I was there, you were the only black county commissioner in Fairfield County with uh, four other white folks, I think it was. What, what did you learn from being an elected official there? Um, you know, I learned a lot in terms of what's going on with the budgets and what's and how the government kind of operates and how it kind of leads uh, minority people and people of color, uh, people with no power out of the loop, but they're included in the foolishness. And I, you know, I would go in rooms and I would sometimes be only black. Sometimes it'd be like 10, 15 people, be three blacks. And two, the two blacks in there, I don't care what white folks are saying, they're grinning and laughing and agreeing. And I asked them, what were you agreeing and laughing about? Because I didn't see them see a damn thing that's beneficial to us. And they, they you know, we either curse me out or walk away from it and they didn't want to deal with that. So, I mean, just learning and being in rooms by myself in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, with elected officials and how deeply uh, ingrained that the racism and bias and things are going on and how do you hold your silence in, in the middle of that? How you, as, as, a, as a, um, what's called, I'm saying about if a black man lives in America, there's no way in the world he can live by day to day with not being just in con complete rage. James Baldwin said that. Um, so so, so, so what I, I've learned a whole lot of patience. I've learned that ignorance is not always curable. Um, I learned that old wounds might stop. Uh, they don't. They don't heal. They just stop bleeding. Uh, those those type of things. And then you learn how to talk to people. You learn to listen to what they really see. What's really going on. And those are some of the lessons that I learned. And uh, I'm still learning, Michael. No, I know you are. Well, uh, I wonder if you have just a few other last thoughts about uh, people who are thinking about running for office. What would you suggest they do right now? What's the what's one thing they should pay attention to if they're thinking of running for office? Well, the first victim of running for office or any debate that you have nowadays, the first victim is truth. You know that. <laughs> Uh, you go to argue, do everything that can keep truth off the off, off the floor. What I would advise for them to do, uh, Michael, read and study. Like I said, I didn't learn to read till I was twenty-one, and once I learned to read and read books and whatnot, I was just unbelievable that black folks were doing the things they were doing. I just didn't know. 
but it's just trying to accumulate the, as much knowledge as you can. Try okay, thank to. You. Yeah. Sorry. Accumulate as much knowledge as you can. We're just about out of time, but I want to thank you, Kamayo Marcheria, elected official and community organizer, one of the most important people in South Carolina for being on We Hold These Truths. And uh, my name again is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm the host of We Hold These Truths. And Kamayo Marcheria, uh, a community organizer and former elected official in Fairfield County, South Carolina, uh, very honored to have as our guest today. Thank you so much, Kamayu. Thank you, Kambali. Thank you. Thank you.